Good morning. Welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheist, agnostic, skeptic, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the website. This is our creed. Seattle Atheist Church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, then you are probably in the right place. So today after church, we will have uh, board games at the Wayward Coffee House on 65th and Roosevelt. Everyone is welcome to join and invited. And I also want to remind you that first Friday of the month is our movie nights. And um, please sign up now because they do um, fill up. Um, it's really a great experience, so um, you don't want to miss it. So we are... Uh, funded by donations so if you'd like to make a donation you go to meetup.com and make a small donation that's used just for the renting of this room the way we do it here is the members ourselves give the talks and we have planning meetings which are open to all of the members um, so um, afterwards we'll have a small discussion circle and uh, without further ado uh, welcome to Brent Kalana Um, today my talk is about uh, suicide, um, and uh, when, I, when I proposed this talk, um, I got some I got some looks from people, kind of like, oh, that's a you know, kind of a depressing topic, uh, <laughs> and uh, I can you know, I can certainly see that, um, but it's also very very interesting to me because I mean if you think about it. Um, throughout these billions of years of evolution, we've um, evolved, you know, to to survive. You know, the instinct of survival is the strongest impulse, and yet we still have people who choose to kill themselves. Um, and we don't really fully understand why. Um, So we have um, we have currently around forty five thousand suicides a year in the U S. Around a million worldwide. So it's not exactly an uncommon thing. Um, we are currently experiencing the um, the highest rates of suicide in uh, thirty years in the U S. So we're on a upward trajectory at the moment. Um, one thing I found that was interesting is that there are uh, there are like um, fifty one percent of suicides use a firearm, um, and uh, Washington State seventy seven percent of of um, gun deaths are suicides, and it's 63% for the U.S. Um, the three largest states, the three states with the most suicide are uh, Wyoming, by a lot, <laughs> and uh, they're way ahead of the second place, which is Alaska, and uh, Montana is the third. Those are also the states that have the um, the highest rates of gun ownership. So you can, you know, take from that what you will. I won't be too political about that, but I would urge anybody who has um, suicidal ideation to not own a firearm because the statistics for that are very, very, uh, very telling. Um, Washington has a actually has a higher than average suicide rate, but we're only number 25. So, not as bad as a lot of places. But. 
Um, and one thing I found that was interesting is that there are um, one thing I found that was interesting was that there are there are like among minority groups like LGBTQ and Native Americans uh, especially there are um, there are suicide rates are out of proportion to their within their group but among suicides as a whole. Um, in the US, who do you think has the highest uh, percentage? Um, Police officers, actually. Well, I mean, among, among um, I guess, among racial gender groups. White men? White men, yeah, 70%. Ooh. So, <laughs> and there's, um, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of speculation on why, but again, nobody really knows. So it's interesting. Um, one of the things that one of the things that I've been hearing is that the um, like privilege is a two-edged sword. So it's kind of like, you know, we society still considers white men to be the most um, capable. And so there's like a higher expectation on them, there's more responsibility put on them, and then when they don't live up to that responsibility, there's not really um, a lot of sympathy for them. <laughs> so that could be what it is, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist, but um, that's what I've that's what I've been reading about it. So, um, anyway, going on. So, we, so usually the way that we argue against suicide is we try to convince the suicidal person that it's not a good idea, right? Um, the book that I'm talking about today is uh, Stay. Uh, History of Suicide and the Philosophies Against It by Jennifer Michael Hecht. Um, and she does she does she does some of that in there also. She does explain she does like try to convince you that it's a bad idea. But the main thrust of the argument is that it's actually morally wrong. Um, And if you look at the statistics, it states the the uh, the, homic the homicide rate is much lower than the suicide rate by a lot. So suicide is like by a factor of at least two to one. Okay, except for two states, um, Louisiana and Maryland, where the homicide rate is slightly higher, but only by you know slightly. So you think like there are much, there's much greater moral compunction against homicide than against suicide. And the argument that Jennifer Hecht makes in this book is that suicide is actually wrong for the same reason that homicide is wrong. It's for two reasons. One is that when you, when you kill yourself, you're also killing your future self who is a different person who may not want to die. So you are preemptively ending that future self's life. Uh, the second reason is that there is a, there's a phenomenon called um, suicide clusters. Because when you commit suicide, there's a higher, there's a greater likelihood that other people will follow your example, and there are numerous cases in the book that, um, that support that. Um, this phenomenon has been studied since um, at least the uh, since the 19th century. 
Uh, there's a book called Suicide Clusters by uh, Lauren, Col Lauren Coleman. It talks to, where there's like several case studies it goes over, like um, between 1973 and 1974 in the town of Durin, or du Durin. <laughs> uh, there were uh, several prominent town members who killed themselves one after the other, and they all knew each other. Um, there have been, um, during the 70s and 80s, there were um, suicide clusters among gay men, uh, especially ones diagnosed with AIDS. And uh, the uh, professionals actually, they actually, cla they actually classified this as a suicide epidemic because it got so bad. Um, there were, 1985, um, a farmer who was heavily in debt committed suicide, and that sparked off um, an epidemic of farmer suicides. So there were, you know, there were obviously, you know, there were obviously other other factors that, com that, con that contributed to the suicide. Like they were under, they were under stress. You know, because there was like a, there was like an agricultural crisis in the '80s, and uh, the gay man had the AIDS epidemic. But there is a there's a um, a um, hypothesis here that that suicide was came to be came to be seen among these groups as an acceptable way of dealing with the stress. Right, so it's similar where if you're in a, if you're during a disaster, where you see somebody looting, and then like somebody, and so then you think, oh well, if they're gonna loot, most people over there are gonna loot, well then I might as well do it too. And so it becomes like a, it becomes an acceptable thing. Whereas you wouldn't, you wouldn't think to do it on your own. Um, There was a um, 2010 study from Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, which showed that um, children of suicides, that is, people who are younger than 18, um, who at that age had a parent who committed suicide, they were three times more likely to commit suicide later than people who did not. I don't care. Um, and it's not just it's not just a case of people simply copying other people either. Um, there was a there was a book and. Um, 1774, written by Wolfgang, Wolfgang von Goethe, called The Sufferings of Young Werther. Um, and um, unfortunately, I have to spoil the book for you. So, sorry about that. But um, so, what happens is, young Werther is a, is a boy who is a, it's a young man who has an affair with a married woman, and it doesn't work out, and he kills himself. And after this book became popular, there was a there was a spike in the suicide rate. And they found like a lot of these a lot of these people who committed suicide, they had the book with them. And it was often open to the part of the book where Werther commits suicide. Uh, some people even dressed up as Werther before they killed themselves. So and due to this, the book was banned in, um, in several European countries, and Gietje even added a disclaimer in future editions saying, uh, do not follow my example. No, but <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, the, um, in uh, 1974, the sociologist um, David Phillips he called this the Werther effect. 
Um, and it's been, it's been used since then to refer to these types of imitative, um, imitative suicides. He was using it to apply, he was, he was applying it to um, uh, celebrity suicides. Like when um, Marilyn Monroe committed suicide, the uh, suicide rate went up 12%. Um, So, that's interesting. Um, there were, um, another, another, another uh, case that's interesting is the, um, is military suicides have been going up also. And, um, in the 2000s, during the Afghan war, there were more U.S. troops who died in suicide than in combat. Um, in 2012, when this book was, uh, when this book was printed, uh, there were, the U.S. military lost 349 people, more than it died in combat. Um, so when people when people look at these statistics, they go like, "Well, you know, this is terrible what we're doing to these young people. We're putting them into the horrors of war. You know, they they see their fellow troops get killed and um, wounded. They have to kill other people. You know, it's but when you but." Jennifer Hecht, she dug into the statistics a little bit deeper, and there's a bit more than meets the eye here, because there's a study between 2005 and 2010 said that one-third of these troops had never been deployed. 43% had only been deployed once, and 8.5%, only 8.5%, had been deployed three to four times. A 2008 to 2011 study showed that 52% had never been deployed. So again, it's part you know it's part of the it's part of the stress of war, but it's also there's a culture that has become a culture that has become used to using suicide as a way of dealing with stress, and that's that's her argument. Um, uh, Frank Frank J. Zanier, a, um, a psychologist, did a study on this. Um, on the suicide clusters, and he said, there are three vectors for suicidal contagion. There's geographical, um, so if there's somebody in your, you know, in your region that you live in who's committed suicide. Um, there's psychological, which is how closely you identify with the person who committed suicide. And there's social, it's like if they're in your network of people, and these are all uh, predictors of um, of suicide. Like especially if the person has a history of mental illness or psychological trauma. So we are all very closely connected to each other, much more than we realize. And um, everybody has this. Everybody has like this, you know, this road they have to hoe, you know, that to go through life, they have problems, and a lot of times they don't even talk to their closest loved ones what their problems are. And when they see somebody else decide to opt out like that, it can give them an idea that that's the kind of, that maybe they can do that too. It's very interesting. I just, and, um, 
It was something I never even thought of before I read this book. But, um, so what, what gave her the idea to write this book? What, what gave her the impetus was she had, she had a, a friend, a friend of hers who was um, a poet, took her life. And then two years later, a mutual friend of theirs, um, also a poet, she also took her life. And these were both women who were very, you know, they were successful. They were doing what they loved. She didn't have any, any, um, any premonition that this would happen in either case. And so this prompted her to um, write a, um, a blog post about this for, um, for the, uh, the best American poetry, is a blog. Um, she said, so I want to say this, and forgive me the strangeness of it. Don't kill yourself. Life has always been almost too hard to bear for a lot of the people, a lot of the time. It's awful. But it isn't too hard to bear. It's only almost too hard to bear. <laughs> um, says, I'm issuing a rule. You are not allowed to kill yourself. When a person kills himself, he does wrenching damage to the community. One of the best predictors of suicide is knowing a suicide. That means that suicide is also delayed homicide. You have to stay. So, maybe not typically the kind of thing that um, we say to suicidal people, <laughs> but um, the Boston Globe picked it up and printed it, and uh, apparently it worked for a lot of people, because she had a lot of people come to her after that and say that um, they'd been contemplating suicide and she changed their mind, or she had people who, um, someone who was a, a um, had a suicidal family member, and she had said what they wanted to say, but they didn't have the words for it. Um, and that's what inspired the book. Um, she has, uh, she's written a couple of other books. Um, one of them is The Happiness Myth, that's also really good. There's one called Doubt. Um, and in all of these, she looks at history. She draws inspiration from history. And um, that's what she does here also. She talks about, she, she starts out by talking about how the church um, made suicide a crime. And um, the way the church, the way the church looked at it was that you are, you are God's possession. So you don't have the right to take your life because you didn't, you didn't give yourself your life. God did. So you belong to God. Okay. And the way that they punished this was very, was very brutal. They would, um, they would take the corpse of the person and commit suicide. They'd drain through the streets. They would like leave them out in the sun to rot, and um, they would, uh, they would, um, they could also uh, confiscate your estate. So, and of course this was terrible because it punished the, um, they wound up punishing the relatives of the, of the person. But uh, it did, it did also have the effect of preventing a lot of suicides because we have Accounts. We have numerous accounts of people contemplating it, but they changed their mind. You know, they decided not to go through with it because they knew of how they would, of what their family would have to go through. So, um, so it was it was terrible and it was um, an unethical way of dealing with it, but it was effective. Um, now the problem, as as Hecht sees it, is that as the influence of the church 
began to decline and the enlightenment started, these, um, these punishments were no longer um, employed. Um, it was no longer acceptable for the church to do this. And um, enlightenment philosophers began to actually argue in favor of suicide. In a way of saying like, well, you know, if you want to take your own life, you know, that is your, that is your right, you know. We can't say that that's wrong. And as a result, it did become to be more socially acceptable and the, the rate of suicide did begin to rise. Um, so in the latter part of the book, she has a lot of arguments from philosophers against suicide also. And she demonstrates that not all of the not all of the enlightenment was in agreement on this. But um, but first, she goes back to um, ancient philosophers. We have um, um, Aristotle and uh, Socrates, and they they demonstrate what the pre-Christian what the pre-Christian arguments against suicide work. Um, Aristotle says, a person who cuts his throat in a fit of anger is doing this voluntarily, contrary to correct reason, and the law does not allow it. So he is acting unjustly. But towards whom? Surely towards the city, not himself, since he suffers voluntarily. And the kind of dishonor attaches to the person who has done away with himself on the ground that he has perpetrated an injustice against the city. So to Aristotle, to Aristotle, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the Christian view, but instead of God, it's the city. So you have this responsibility uh, to the city, like a soldier, you know, you don't leave, you don't leave your post, right? Um, to Socrates, it was uh, Socrates, Socrates thought similarly. Like a lot of people think, a lot of people consider Socrates to be a suicide because although he was sentenced to death, he could have very easily avoided it. Uh, Socrates had um, he had a lot of a lot of friends who were uh, very very influential. They had, some of them had deep pockets. They could have easily bribed a guard to look the other way. And his friends could have sneaked him out of prison and he could have gone into exile. But Socrates would have none of that. He said, he said, look, okay, the city is what is what created me. You know, the city raised me up. I would be nothing without the city. And now that the city has decided that I'm going to die, I have to go along with it. But, but aside from that, you do not, you do not have the, you do not have the right to, um, to take your own life. You know. He says that a man should wait and not take his own life until he is summoned, as I am summoned now. Um, now, as for the, as for the Enlightenment, um, there's a uh, French philosopher, Nicolas Malebranche, one of the ones. He said that ourselves are owned by. He said that ourselves are owned by by God, the state, our family, and our friends. So we have this responsibility to our communities to to uh, that we have to uphold. Um, Dennis Diderot is another philosopher. Um, just a second here. So everyone is of use to their communities in some way, so they don't have the right to destroy themselves. He said, it cannot be said that a man can find himself in a situation in which he was assured that he is of no use to society, 
This situation is not at all possible. Um, so yeah, again, there's that common theme. Um, Immanuel Kant had a bit more uh, nuanced view of it. Um, of course, he's a famous philosopher. Um, in his groundwork of metaphysics and morals, he wrote that, again, suicide is wrong because it is murder, and it violates your duties to your community, to your spouse, to your children, to your superiors, and to your fellow citizens. But moreover, if you're strong enough to confront death in that way, if you're strong enough to take your own life, that shows that you have an uncommon strength of character. And you should put that same strength into staying alive. So interestingly, the ability like the ability to actually confront death in that way and to attempt suicide shows that you are actually strong enough to go on living, if that, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so if you are able to kill yourself, you are more than able to stay alive and you should remain. That was Kant's argument. Um, he saw life as a duty and a responsibility. Also, uh, the, uh, the big philosophical idea that Kant is famous for is the, the, categorical, uh, the categorical imperative. <laughs> um, so I'll try to explain that as best as I can. Um, so <clears throat> basically the way I understand it is that the, categor the categorical imperative is you, it is not right to do a thing that, that if everyone did it, would cause society to fall apart. Right? Is that? If, if everyone did it, would you want the result? If everyone did it, would you want the result? Right, okay. <laughs> so obviously, if everybody committed suicide, that would, there wouldn't even be a society anymore. So. So it also goes against the categorical imperative. Um, now she closes out the book with two of the more two of the more interesting thinkers, um, Emil Durkheim, and um, a uh, sociologist who wrote a pioneering book called. Um, suicide in 1897. His argument was that there are, there are four types of suicides. There are egoistic, which is when there are no sense, when the person has no sense of community or meaning of life, and there's depression or apathy. There's altruistic, which is the opposite of egoistic, um, which would, which is more like a martyrdom, where you're, where you're dying for a cause. There is anomic, is someone who has like a social or economic upheaval, like a, losing a job or a divorce, or having a family member dying. And there is fatalistic, which is where someone is just so frustrated because their desires are being thwarted. Um, Durkheim did not believe that religion could cure suicide. He didn't believe that science could cure it either. Um, his prescription was a type of community connection that he called corporation, where you have a sense where you are, where you have a sense of something bigger than yourself. Um, he thought that is what would prevent um, of suicide, is like having these strong community, community ties and working together for a common cause. Um, and his argument 
against su suicide again was it was wrong because it harms the community, it breaks those breaks those ties. It does a violence against your um, against your social network. Um, finally, the most uh, the most interesting, most intriguing one, rather, is the philosopher Albert Camus. Um, and he has this unusual existential outlook on suicide. He sees life as inherently absurd. So he compares it to um, the story of Sisyphus. Right? So you have the story of Sisyphus was he, he was cursed to push this huge rock up a hill every day and then it would roll back down and then you have to go and push it back up again for all eternity. <laughs> and and that is what that is how that is how he saw life. But rather than seeing that as as um, something you should try to escape from, he said that this is something that you should actually um, you should actually um, get purpose out of. Rather, it's. Um, <laughs> it's rather, it's rather. I'll, I'll do my best to explain it, but it's rather, a, it's rather a nuanced. Um, to him, to him, a uh, quantity of life is as important as quality, because existence is like an end unto itself. He's like, there is no, there is no substitute for twenty years of life, even if. You know, you have the most dull, boring life. There's no, there's no substitute for that. Right? So, like people, people view, like people view, um, some people view suicide as a revolt, but Camus, Camus viewed it as the ultimate acceptance. It's like no, the true revolt, the true revolt is living in the face of pain and suffering. So I don't know if that's um, if that's an argument that you would want to lead with um, or not, but <laughs> it's um, it's a, it's a very it's a very interesting one, and um, I think if you um, I think for certain people that would be a um, a good argument. But finally, I'd like to leave you with. Um, the closing words from her book, which say, if we meditate on the record of human wisdom, we may find there reason enough to persist and find our way back to happiness. The first step is to consider the arguments and evidence and choose to stay. After that, anything can happen. First, choose to stay. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.